Hello, uh, aficionados of dry bones, philosophical bones. As I've mentioned many times, Geshe Sopa used to say, you know, we're going to be chewing some dry bones. <laughs> no, no sinews, no fat on them, just dry. So uh, you have to have the Dharma patience uh, to, to contemplate. So we're going to begin, as usual, with some prayers. Uh, Mary Ellen's going to put up, in case you don't know them by now, which would be amazing. Sange Chodang Soki Chognam La Changchu Bardu Dagni Kapsuchi Dagi Chunyen Gipe Sognam Ki Gola Penchir Sange Drupa Shog. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened. That means not only taking refuge from the suffering of the lower realms or the extent of samsara, but taking refuge from eliminating the obstructions to omniscience, because we say, I take refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly of Arya Bodhisattvas. Through the collections I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit migrators. Sange Chodang Soki Chognam La Jangchu Bardu Dagni Kapsuchi Dagi Chunyan Gipe Sognam Ki Drola Penchir Sange Drupa Then a short mandala offering to our, you know, Dharmakaya gurus, our, our primordial guru, whether it be the Dalai Lama or Lama Sopa Rinpoche or Yangtze Rinpoche, Serkon Rinpoche, or Dakpo Rinpoche, by offering this ground anointed with perfume and strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and moon, visualize as a Buddha realm, may all migrators enjoy a pure realm. O holy and perfect pure Lama, from the clouds of compassion that form, that dwell in the skies of your Dharmakaya wisdom. Please release, send down a rain of vast and profound Dharma. Vast means the teachings on the extensive deeds, the Bodhisattvas, and the profound means especially the perfection of wisdom, precisely in accordance with the needs of those to be trained. Iram Guru Rana Manalakam Niryatayami. Okay, good to see you. Hi, Jennifer, Paul. Oh, Don's made it. Good. Nice to see all of you. Okay, so we're going to begin with a, a, a short meditation. Uh, as my brother's answering machine used to say, you know what to do.
then with your mind slightly calmed away from disturbing thoughts, turn your attention to your mental consciousness. The contents at first. And the nature, the clear light nature of the mind within which those thought processes, emotions, so forth are situated like clouds in an otherwise clear sky. By concentrating on those moments when the mind is quiet, try to keep that, elongate that. Even when the mind is besieged by many thoughts, in one instant, you can let go of those by remembering that the reason those thoughts are present is due to this non-obstructing nature of the mind, the clear light nature of the mind. Our developmental Buddha nature. You were practiced and remember well the consequences of having this. You can kind of unite this experience of recognizing the clear light nature with a blissful consciousness. Oh, wow. You can think to yourself <laughs> when you go out of, uh, you know, when you know in those moments when you're not focused single pointedly on the clear light nature. This means I can change myself, I can become better. I can become, I can overcome all my faults because they are not part of my mind. They're not the very nature of the mind. They're mental events that are transitory. And I can develop all of those qualities that I admire in the great beings. Compassion, renunciation, wisdom, And stepping back, recognizing the fact that we can feel this joy <clears throat> in recognizing the development, developmental Buddha nature is due to this auspicious moment of having a life of leisure and richness, leisure and endowments. I'm freed of unfree states that I might very well find myself in. Next, next week, t tonight, I die <laughs> in the hell realms, greater realm, animal realm. Even certain long life gods where their attention is not even focused on creating mental dharma, mental virtue, their whole life just goes in using up what virtue they have. It's an unfree state. We're not born in a state where you're unfree to practice the Dharma, like sometimes has been the case in communist China or other countries. We're not born at a time bereft of the Dharma. In fact, we're born at a time when there is still a continuity of the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha. 
there is a continuity of the ordained Sangha with whom I can take ordination of a lay person or a monk or nun. There's a spiritual bodhisattva community, tantra community. The, the teachings have not degenerated. There are still beings who've realized it. We have patrons and so forth. At a moment like this, with the clear light nature of the mind, developmental Buddha nature, I can infuse my mind with the great results, sort of do the great experiments in the laboratory of my mind to develop thoughts that I never thought I could develop, equalizing and exchanging myself with others. Taking others as more important than myself. <clears throat> Real empathy as a cause of developing compassion. Putting oneself in the shoes of others. Leaving imprints as in the Lama Chopa Pujo one verse says, the, the door, the mind that would set sentient beings, mother sentient beings in bliss is the doorway to infinite qualities. In order to do these things, we need to know the teachings. Unlike, sort of like the example of a armless alpine mountain climber. They can't do very much. They can't get very far. Without knowing the teachings, we can't accumulate the collection of merit nor the collection of wisdom and the great text by Lama Tsongkhapa that we're studying, Illumination of the Intent, Illumination of the Intention, Gompa Rapsel, commentary on Chandrakirti's Majama Kavatara, which in turn is a meaning commentary of Nargajuna's fundamental wisdom, give the answers how to accumulate merit, how to accumulate the collection of wisdom. So think, I'm going to participate today for the purpose of benefiting all mother sentient beings. <clears throat> Who've been depthlessly kind since beginningless time. Like the first verse of the eight verses of training the mind. Determined to achieve for sentient beings the greatest benefit, those beings who excel the wish-fulfilling gem. It means by cultivating them, by making offerings to them, being kind to them, being patient with them, practicing the six paramitas with respect to them, having compassion for them, bodhicitta, I can, their, their sentient beings are more precious, more valuable than a, a genie's lamp or wish-fulfilling gem. I'm going to listen to the teachings, participate, contemplate on the meanings, try to understand them. When I get a glimmer of understanding, hold that single-pointedly for as long as you can to develop the wisdoms of hearing, contemplation, and wisdom. I'm going to participate in order to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. Okay. Good to see you. Hi, Zuvansh. Don's here. Okay. Good to see everyone. So how are we doing? Any uh, 
Oh, Paul, any updates since yesterday on Jeffrey Hopkins? You had given me some more information yesterday. Yeah, I've not heard anything. In fact, I was just I was checking my email right before the class to see if I have anything from Betsy, but nothing more. So um, I'm assuming he is doing better. Uh, I haven't heard otherwise. I so the heard anything emergency more. that we heard the other day that he was back to the emergency room quelled and he was in a room where you said might be physical therapy rehabilitation or something yeah something i i don't have any details but it it seems like yeah he's just he's um uh, having i guess the effects of of whatever surgery or treatments he's been having so it's a little unstable but um apparently he's still okay right good excellent okay that's good to hear so um how are we doing? Anyone have any Dharma question they'd like to address uh, from the previous talks? KT, Anna, Jennifer, Diana, anything? No? Don? <laughs> John is very easily... Uh, satisfied he doesn't ha he doesn't have a lot of questions usually yeah john campbell don't don't crash you have any questions john of course we can't hear you i don't i don't and i'm not gonna i'm not driving i wouldn't i wouldn't attempt this. Oh, okay that's good to know okay <laughs> okay so we are at uh, a point in the text we're starting today um, in Jimpa's written text, page 179. And I'll mention for Diana Bramo and anyone else who's only got a digital, what that is in the digital copies in a second. Anne Klein's translation, page 173. Uh, in Anne Klein's book, it says, then if the parts and holes were different entities, they would be unrelated. In Jimpa's text, it says, you can type in, search for next comma, if the parts and bearer of the parts are distinct entities. That's where we're going to, that's essentially where we're going to be starting. But just to go back um, a page or several paragraphs before that, uh, Lama Tsongkhapa had said, according to Jumpa's translation, given that there will be no presentation of the unique style of negation through reasoning by Svatantraka Majamaka in the subsequent sections, I will briefly explain here in a manner easy to comprehend, which we, we chuckled over before when the Lama say easy to comprehend. Uh, I will explain here how phenomena would come to be perceived as illusion-like according to that Svatantra Kamajamaka tradition. So how they <laughs> how they would essentially how they, the, the logic that they use to uh, establish emptiness so that they can have the space-like meditation on emptiness, not just the illusion-like. Um, and Klein said, there is no indication later in Chandra Kirti's text, she puts in, in uh, parentheses there, because Lama Tsongkhapa's commentary is commenting on, on Chandra Kirti. Uh, there's no mention later, no indication later of this Vatantrika's uncommon mode of refutation of true existence. So uncommon means it's not common with the Prasangika. It's not common with any of the lower schools. It's their own exclusive mode of refutation by reasoning. So that would establish uh, emptiness so that you could have the, you could, as a result of that, have the meditative equipoise on emptiness, space-like meditation. Therefore, let us ex express briefly and in words easy to understand how the system how in this system, all phenomena are caused to appear like illusions. Okay, so that's that was just what we uh, 
you know, the end of yesterday, uh, the uh, last week, the next paragraph says, determine the, determining that all knowables, all knowable objects, objects of knowledge, all phenomena are included or subsumed by the twofold classification into conditioned and unconditioned, or we say uh, compounded or uncompounded. There's another way we often translate that. So compounded phenomena are phenomena or conditioned phenomena are phenomena that are impermanent. They arise by due to causes and conditions. Unconditioned phenomena or uncompounded phenomena are phenomena that are not, they don't come about, they're not compounded by causes and conditions, such things as non uncompounded space or unconditioned space. You know, when we, like when we talk about in our meditation, we're not, <clears throat> we're not talking about uh, some kind of visualization of the quality of the mind as being unobstructive, um, but we're trying to focus on that non-affirming negation, which is a uncon which is unconditioned or uncompounded phenomena, permanent phenomena. And conditioned things are further differentiated. Compounded phenomena, permanent phenomena, are further differentiated into material and non-material or not material. Uh, Suvansh, what's the example of a conditioned or compounded thing which is not material? Um, a conditioned thing that is not material is uh, <clears throat> um, uh, could be uh, it could be a a, a mental phenomena uh, an emotion that arises for example um, you know you may be uh, 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 you know uh, uh, you may have an experience of uh, joy uh, which then um, you know will uh, um, it temporarily exists and then goes away so that's well, my example uh, right good yeah uh, all of the mental factors all of the mental phenomena are non-material. The point of that is that they don't they don't share a common continuum with material things. You can't create mind out of material. And likewise, you can't create material out of the mind. Okay, so uh, conditioned things are further differentiated into material and not material. Based on this, one then refutes the notion that matter, material things, uh, is composed so that now it's going into um, material things, right? It's not talking about the non-material. Based on this, then one refutes the notion that matter or material things, uh, matter is composed of particles that are partless in the sense of having no directional parts, such as east and so on, East, West, North, South, Zenith, and Nadir. Usually they talk about the 10 directions, right? So North, North, South, East, West is four. Then the subdirections that makes eight in the plane. And then the, the Zenith and the Nadir, wherever you look, um, they have no directional parts such as East, West, North, South, and so forth. And the notion that mental phenomena are composed of a series of indivisible points devoid of temporal parts, such as the preceding moment and a subsequent moment. So they they believe, um, say the Vaibhashikas and most of the Satrantikas believe that um, material things are composed of composed of partless particles. You could say partless, another way of saying is indivisible, right? You can't break them down any longer. You can you can break down the rock into you know chunks, break down those chunks further, further into <laughs> molecules or 
atoms, essentially. But at, at some point, according to the Vibhashika, uh, you can't divide it any further. It's indivisible. It doesn't have parts. So that's that's uh, being refuted here. And likewise, the mind, that there, there would be some moment of mind that you can't divide any further. The, these refutations one should understand as explained elsewhere. And Jimpa's note 327 says, Tsongkhapa is referring the reader here to such classic expositions as Vasubandhu's critique of atomism <laughs> in his 30 verses, which is a wrong attribution. Uh, it's actually in uh, <laughs> excuse me, it's actually in uh, Vasubundu's other famous text called the 20 verses. So uh, this is one thing for anyone who's keeping track of little errors that we find in uh, Jimpa's translation. I'd, I'd love to have, if anyone's got a list of things that they remember us bringing up in class, uh, I'd love to to see your list, we'll add it to others. Eventually, I'll send Jimpa a Christmas present of, of errata. Generally, he's, yeah, he's a little bit touchy about, I have to approach it the right way. He's a little bit touchy about someone mentioning he might have made a mistake. But anyway, uh, so it's not the 30 verses. It's the, uh, the 20 verses. And uh, one good... One good source of information about that is a text. I don't have the actual physical text here. Text by uh, Stephen Anaker, where he um, seven he he translated seven works of Vasubandhu, including the twenty verses uh, that we're talking about here and the thirty verses that Jimpa erroneously mentions here. So. Um, if you happen to have this text, and I will put it up online afterwards if you'd like to, uh, I'll just mention, I'll just read a little bit of it uh, just to give you an idea. So in verse 11, just before that, so there's a, there's a, a commentary here that, that precedes the verse. It says, but how is it to be understood that the existence, let me put on my, my reading glasses here, it becomes better. Oh, yeah. But how is it to be understood that the existence of sense fields of visibles, visible objects, was spoken of by the exalted one, the Bhagavan, not because those things which simply become sense objects of the perceptions of visibles really exist, but rather with a hidden intention. And the, verse 11 says, a sense object... So it's talking about visual objects, like say if you see a table or a tree or something like that. A sense object is neither a single thing nor several things. So this important it, you I'm gonna I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because in our text it really doesn't spend any time at all. Lama says some Kabbalah says you should know it elsewhere. So I will post this section, um, and if you have that particular text by um, Stephen Anaker, you called Seven Works of Vasubandhu, you can get on Amazon. Um, you can go through all of these things. A sense object is neither a single thing nor several things. For the atomic point of view, from the atomic point of view, nor can it be an aggregate of atoms. So atoms can't be demonstrated. And then in the beginning of verse 12a, it says, through the simultaneous conjunction of six elements, the atom has six parts. So what are those six parts? That means the instead of saying 10 directions, it's, it's you know, north, east, south, and west, up and down, that's six, right? So this is this is sort of one of the classic uh, sources for this argument about, you know, debunking or disproving, refuting uh, partless atoms. 
to a simultaneous conjunction of six elements, the atom has six parts. And the next verse is, if there was a common lot locus of the six, the agglomeration would only be one atom. Agglomeration means if there was if there was something where they came together, if they're partless atoms, uh, there wouldn't be uh, many. There would just be one. The, the combination of them, or as he says, agglomeration of them, would just be one atom. And then verse 13 says, when there is no conjunction of the atoms, how can there be one for their aggregations? Their conjunction is not demonstrated for they also have no parts. Okay, I'm not gonna read any any further, but I will post that up on the, on the web. So that's one of the things that Jimpa says, uh, he quotes the wrong text, but that's that's one of the sources uh, to refute this. Also, not only to refute partless particles, uh, but to refute the existence of objects uh, as having some kind of unitary nature. You know, like, like you, you see the table. Uh, you see the parts, of course, because the parts of the table and the table are of one nature. If you see one, you see the other and so forth. So the other great um, presentation of this is, as, long, as Jimpa says correctly this time, Shantarakshita's ornament of the middle way. And we have in English, a really superb translation. I've mentioned it before at other times, by my dear friend, Jim Blumenthal. Can you read that? Is that clear? The ornament of the middle way. So Majamaka Alamkara by Shantarakshita. Jim Blumenthal was a student of Geshe Zopa who passed away a few years ago. Beloved uh, teacher at my Tripa Institute. Incredible, uh, incredibly kind guy. Uh, one of his one of his hobbies. Did anyone know Jim Blumenthal here? But Paul, yeah. Uh, one of his hobbies was baseball cards. He had this in, in incredibly extensive <laughs> baseball card collection. He's left by his, his his you know left behind his wife and his son, who he felt and upon meeting the Dalai Lama was a tulku. At, at any rate. Jim was a student of Geshe Zopa, and this was kind of like his PhD thesis is really excellently done. So I'm just going to mention here, uh, and I can put this up later, on page 66 of that text, that translation by Jim. There is the refutation of unitary objects asserted by Buddhist schools. So this is a commentary on Shantarakshita's uh, refutation of unitary objects. So it says, the next subject to which Shantarakshita applies the neither one nor many argument. Have you heard that expression before? Neither one nor many? Stephen, you had your hand up, but I'll ask you, do you know what that's referring to? When we, when we talk the about- The temple is empty of monks. When we talk, when we talk about the person, the person is not one with the aggregates and not different than the aggregates. It's a little bit different, but there are other arguments that uh, if something existed inherently or truly, it would have to be one. It have to be a singularity or a multiplicity, one or many. Shantarakshita applies the neither one nor many argument, applies the neither one nor many argument, are those objects asserted by Buddhists to be uncompounded, permanent, and truly singular. He does not specifically label his opponent uh, in either the, the Majamaka Alankara, this text that Jim translated, 
or in its commentary. He wrote his own uh, commentary to it, auto commentary. Although Kamala Shira does identify the opponent as the Vaibashikas, Vaibashikas. And so I'll just read one verse here. Verse three, even those uncompounded objects of knowledge, so now we're talking about uh, like emptiness or space and so forth, even those uncompounded objects of knowledge known by the knowledge which arises in meditation for an aria, according to the system of the Vibhashikas, are not unitary because they are related to successive moments of knowledge, because they are subjects and objects through the ob although the objects are related in a change in consciousness, which is which is the subject, if one were to ask whether they may be nonetheless be of single nature, the answer is no. <laughs> okay, so that's all I'm going to say. So this this I'll leave for you to um, do some research. Um, if you're interested, you can consult either of these two books, the, the text by Stephen Anaker that has many of the translations of Vasubandhu. It's a really good resource. Or Jim Blumenthal's uh, translation of Shanta Rakshita. So in that, in that context, just to put these people into uh, perspective, Here we're talking about Vasubandhu wrote the, the 20 stanzas and Shantarakshita wrote his commentary, Majamaka Alamkara. Who came first? John, you know? Uh, Vasubandhu was much earlier. He came first as in chronologically? Yeah. Yeah, yeah Vasubandhu, Vasubandhu was was about, uh, I don't know, 700 years earlier. The Vasubandhu, they place around the third century, I believe, and Shantarakshita would have been, I'm not sure, eighth century. He had on some kind of a blue uniform with a Right. Uh, I don't know. I hear someone. Is that the radio on, John? It probably is. Maybe mute. Okay. Okay. So, um, in the fourth century, Asanga and Vasubandhu were existing. Uh, Asanga was born around 310 or something like that, died 390. So, that's all in the fourth century. 300. I mean, what do we have in our. Western history around there, not much going on in the West. Vasubandhu supposedly was younger, but the chronology looks like they wouldn't have coincided, although many of the stories talk about them being, you know, communicating with one another. Vasubandhu supposedly was born in 420 and died 80 years later at, at, at the year 500. But I think those are, uh, those are suspect. But anyway, they're quite early, right? In the eighth century, uh, Padmasambhava came to Tibet and brought along with him Shantarakshita, who is the author of the Majamaka Alam Alamkara. So that was Shantarakshita was about 725, Vasubandhu was about 420, so 300 years difference. So um, Shantarakshita certainly would have known about. Vasubandhu's uh, 20 stanzas, but he doesn't mention it anywhere in his text. So that's kind of interesting. Shantarakshita, Kamala Shila was also in the 8th century. Sometime later, the 11th century, Atisha, Marpa, Milarepa came. And then three centuries later, in the 14th century, Lama Tsongkhapa. So you get, kind of get an idea. Uh, Asanga, and Vasubandhu way back in the in the fourth century, Shantarakshita in the eighth century, uh, Tisha started all of the sort of what we call the new the new school uh, in the eleventh century, and Lama Tsongkhapa in the fourteenth century. So Paul uh, Shantarakshita was. Uh, 
Gelukba or what? Um, Yogacara Svatantrika Madhyamaka, I believe. Gelukpa is a Tibetan. Yeah, yeah. I'm asking Gelukpa or what was he? Was he Sakya? <laughs> well, he, he predated all of those Tibetan sects. Well, he came along with, uh, Shanti Rakshita came <clears throat> along with Padmasambhava. So in some estimations, you'd have to say he was a Nyingma, although he probably didn't recognize, they, they didn't even call, I don't think they called themselves Nyingma at that time until later. Um, so that's an interesting thing. So, okay, so that's that's some research you can do if you'd like to go into more detail about this. Uh, these refutations Jimbo translates should be known, should be under these refutations one should understand as explained elsewhere. So we've got two sources, the 20 stanzas and Shantarakshita's Majamaka Alamkara. The text continued, one establishes in this way the <laughs> excuse me, the logical entailment the pervasion that all conditioned things are composed of parts. So we start from that. All compounded phenomena are composed of parts. That's a very important thing to remember. You can't have a unitary uh, physical thing, uh, whether it be whether it be physical or whether it be mental. When I said physical, that that would be part of the conditioned things. The other part is the non-material, which would include, um, right, the mental factors and so forth, the mind and so forth. And then, of course, there's a third category of of compounded phenomena. Jennifer, do you know the third category of compounded phenomena? Um, the non-associated compositional factors. Right. So uh, mental factors and so forth are called co compositional factors but non-associated compositional factors are those things uh, that, <laughs> that are impermanent, not, ma uh, not material, and not mind either. Like, say, the person. The person is impermanent. It's a, it's a non-associated compositional factor. There are, there are a list of several other things. Sean, what do you think? Um, I was just, the thought of... I think it was a story about Khandra Kirti where people were saying he didn't study much and stuff. And then they, he somehow was milking a painting of a cow um, after he had let all the cows loose into the forest. Yeah. I don't um, think they ever said he didn't study. He was the abbot of what was it? Nalanda, I think. Is that right, Paul? You didn't? I think so. Yeah. I think Nalanda. But and is that so a, is that milk? Alanda is not like an honorary title, like to become, uh, you know, like president of a company or something like private company. You don't do anything. He he was uh, he was known to be a great scholar, and uh, because there was so much work to do, he couldn't go out and take care of the being the abbot. He had responsibility of getting milk and other things, curd and butter for the monks, for their tea and food and so forth. So instead of going out and cultivating them, uh, he drew a picture of a cow on his wall, maybe in his abbot's quarters. <laughs> it would be interesting if you could find that where, where there was it in Nalanda, which you know, there's still some stone around, you know, some buildings still around at Nalanda. See if you could find the picture deep down there. And he supposedly milked the picture to try to uh, show to others that uh, phenomena were not inherently existent. So that's another story that will come later again. But OK, but so is that, is that a material or a mind? The milk that comes milk? from the Yeah, the milk would have been. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe he was, he was, Chandra Kirti was also a great tantric practitioner, right? So Chandra Kirti wrote commentaries. I think Paul and John, uh, what did he write? Guya Samaja, 
Chandrakirti wrote Guya Samaja commentaries? Yeah, commentary on, on the Guya Samaja Tantra. It's the, the kind of big one in the tantra, of his tantric works. And the five stages and so forth and so on. So he may have been using some tantric, sort of tantric, uh, I don't know what you would say, magic powers. Okay, mm -hmm. let's leave that. I know you you love those kind of things, Sean. But let's see. Paul, what do you, what do you think? I was just going to say, I actually asked that question to Gyume Kensa Rinpoche uh, oh, yeah. about this, about, um, um, oh. and and his response, he said two things. He said, one, it wasn't just any cow, but it was a literally a cow that was milkable. In other words, I can't remember, we don't really, it's like a milk cow or something, whatever the phrase they use in English. So it wasn't just a cow, but it was specifically a cow that could give milk. There was the image of the drawing. And so then I said, well, where did the milk come from? And he said, well, obviously it couldn't come from the drawing. <laughs> <laughs> he said it had to come from someplace. Right. But it couldn't come from the drawing. He right. said it would have to. So, you know, maybe it's more like, what is it? It's Kashipa who like reaches into the earth and retrieves the begging bowl of the previous Buddha sort of thing. Or maybe mm -hmm. it was something like that. But yeah, I don't know. But he said yeah. that. He said that's it's an unresolved issue, but it, he said it didn't come from the wall. That's for sure. Okay, so good. I think I'm glad to hear you, my cancer had th that much to say. So, uh, yeah, some magic powers. So uh, the text continues. This is where we were meant to start today. Next. So we've just talked about compounded phenomena whether they be material or non-material, like the mind, they all have, uh, th there's no partless part particle of them. There's no partless moment of mind. There's no partless atom of material. Next, if the parts and the bearer of the parts are distinct entities, they will then become unrelated, which is rejected, and thus they are shown to be a single entity. Or as Anne says, then if parts and whole, so when it says, what does Jim say? Part collect, I'm going to say the parts and bearer of the parts. So usually we say cha, cha dang, cha chen. Cha means part. Cha chen means that which has parts. That means the bearer of the parts. Or, or, or Anne just says the whole. It's a little bit like... Uh, it, we often find this word uh, chen uh, in, in many kinds of things like this. So if the parts in the whole are different entities, so what would that mean? Like if the legs of the table were a different entity than the table itself, that'd be crazy, right? They would be unrelated if they were different entities they would be unrelated. Thereby, that's refuted because the uh, legs of a table or the parts of anything, the parts of a chariot, are related to the chariot. They're not unrelated. And thus, they're shown to be of one entity. So that means uh, when you talk about the succession of argumentation in the Shantarakshita's let's say the Svatantrika explanation of this, of, of uh, emptiness, the logic that they're using, that's what we're going about here. Besides the, th the fact that their compounded phenomena are not partless, uh, they have parts, and the parts in the bearer of the, of the parts are of the same entity. Okay, is that making sense? Richard, what do you think? Making sense? Sort of. Um, the problem that I'm having is that th if you have, let's say there are five parts to a, you know, to an object, um, but are, it would have to be all the parts of the object um, that are the same entity as the object. You, yes. Four parts couldn't be the object. So right. I'm not sure I, I completely understand w what is being said here. 
So <laughs> something has five parts, like say the first person, <laughs> five aggregates, right? Uh, or something has five parts. Uh, there are a lot of questions involved there, but if the parts were of a, of a different entity than the whole or that which possesses the parts, like say the table, let's say, does the table have legs, Richard? A, ta a table has legs, yes, but the legs, the legs aren't the table. Right, exactly. There are parts of the ta the, ta the table plus the legs plus the top arranged in a certain way or a table yeah okay so so the <laughs> arrangement the arrangement seems to me i mean maybe i'm just not understanding it but all the parts plus all the parts for me doesn't equal the table because you can have all those parts lying flat together and they wouldn't be a table it's right. the table it's the it's the parts plus the arrangement <laughs> that equals the table in our mind uh, you're you're presaging the Prasangika argument later on, uh, which is being which refutes all of those things that you just it's, that seem so logical to us. Uh, from the Prasangika point of view, uh, the 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 table is not the parts. It's not uh, it's not the possessor of the parts. Uh, let's say, let's say <laughs> the table is not the parts. It's imputed on the collection of parts. But here, this Vatantrik is not talking about that, okay? Is here is saying uh, that if the parts and the whole were different entities, distinct entities, they would become unrelated. You couldn't say that the, that the, the tables, you couldn't use the phrase, the legs of the table, because they would be different entities different things. Okay. So yeah, here, I think I sort of understand the distinction now. Okay. So it's now good. at this point, Jimpa's text says, now at this point, however much one directs one's thought to a given thing, it becomes undeniable that the parts and their whole or their bearer of the parts, you know, like the legs, the top and so forth, those are the parts and the whole uh, means the table or the bearer of the parts, that which bears the parts. It becomes undeniable that the parts and their bearer, though being single entity, they're the same entity, they appear as if they are distinct. Just as you're kind of thinking, you know, you have that qualm, you know, they seem like, yeah, the table seems to be something different than the parts. But if, if things are one nature, one entity, uh, when you perceive uh, any part of it, you perceive the whole, you are said to perceive that thing. So here, let's, let's read. It becomes undeniable that parts in their bearer, though being a single entity, appear as if they are distinct. Like a magician's illusion, the convergence of two facts is established. The appearance of things as something and their emptiness of it. So how do you apply that here? Uh, do we have... Mikhail's not here today, right? Okay. Uh, KT, can you apply that to this particular situation? Here it says that that sentence like a ma magician's illusion, the convergence of two facts is established, colon, the appearance of things is something and their, and their emptiness of it, or their being empty of it. So there's the, the fact that there is the table and the appearance of the table, but the fact that it's also made of the parts, so then, if you can split it into parts, that would be an emptiness of table. Maybe, is, am I on the right track? <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, you're, <laughs> you're circling. I'm uh, circling. So, uh, uh, so here, the magicians, the, the Spatantrika uh, use of the magician's oh. illusion, right? 
Okay. Was talking yeah. about how something right. say for for the magician, uh, it it appeared to be a horse, yeah. but he knew it was empty of that. That that he knew that the horse was a falsity, was not true. So here, at this point, no matter how much one distracts one's mind, one's thought to a given thing, it becomes undeniable that parts in their bearer, though being a single entity, appear as if they are distinct. Or as Anne translates, at that time, no matter how the mind looks into it, it is undeniable that although the mode of being and she has in, in brackets, of parts and whole, parts and whole, the mode of being of parts and whole to be one entity is to be one entity. It's undeniable. They're one entity. They're not different entities. Yet in their mode of appearance to thought, they appear to be different entities. She puts in parentheses in brackets again, to thought. So that means when you think about the table, can think, oh yeah, my table. And when you think about your the, the surface of your table got scratched, uh, or, or you know, that it's been repainted, uh, all of those things seem to be different than the table itself. The color of the table seems to be different than the than the table when you think about it. There, thereby it is settled that functioning things are like a magician's illusions. That is, a combination of two things, appearing one way, appearing to be two, to be two different things, but in reality they're one, right? They, they appear to be, to thought they appear to be different entities, but appearing one way and being empty of existing that way. That means they are not distinct entities. They are not different entities. Is that making sense? Karen, what do you think? Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, good. David? Yeah, you're, you're kind of like Don, you don't have it. You're happy to, happy to hear, okay. okay. And I'm still struggling with my mom's image being permanent so i'm on a different <laughs> <laughs> you're still you're still caught on the permanent mental image how a mental image can be permanent okay okay so here this is one of their things so they're saying um like a magician's illusion the convergence of two facts is established in chimpa's translation the appearance of things is something and their emptiness of it or as Anne says, a combination of two, appearing one way, that is the appearance of things. Jimpa says the appearance of things as something. I think Anne's translation is more literal from the Tibetan. Appearing one way. How is that appearing? It doesn't mean to the senses. It means, well, in a sense, it also to the senses, but to thought, it appears that the table and its parts are different entities, appearing one way and being empty of existing that way. That means using the word empty here to get to, toward the sense of emptiness, okay? So then the text continues. This is not a problem for a false mode of existence posited through our cognition. So that's not a problem for the magician's magical horse. It appears to the audience and to the magician as being real, but uh, it is actually empty of being real, right? Empty of being true. It is a falsity. So that's there's no problem for uh, for false mode of existence posited through our cognition. But such a convergence, what is it? What is it? Just keep on saying convergence here. And using the word combination, uh, that means appearing one way 
and actually being something different. Remember when we talked about the meaning of truth on many occasions, from the Prasangika point of view, something is true if its mode of existence, how it actually is, concurs, is, is in harmony with how it appears. If it, uh, or, you know, like William, <laughs> our dear William Santa Claus uh, appears to be Santa Claus, but we know it's, it's uh, empty of that, right? But if such a convergence becomes un, untenable, but such a convergence becomes untenable if we are speaking of an objective mode of existence not posited by the virtue of its perception in cognition. John, you're, you're, you're unmuted, so I'm hearing some, something in the background there. There you go. So this is important here. So it's not a problem when you're talking about something which is recognized as false, even conventionally. But such a convergence, such a combination becomes untenable if we are speaking of an objective mode of existence not posited by the virtue of its perception and cognition. Or as Anne says, where is it? Although such such is not contradictory in the context of the mode of subsistence of a falsity, like the horse, posited through the force of appearing to an awareness, if a certain base, that is to say, a certain phenomena, had a mode of subsistence, or as Jimpa says here, objective mode of existence, a mode of subsistence, not posited through the force of appearing to an awareness, so that remember when when Svat Tantric is talking about emptiness, they're talking about phenomena are empty of having some kind of natural uh, mode of existence that is not posited by the force of appearing to a consciousness, an awareness. Remember the 50-50, you know, it's not enough that that phenomena are. Uh, for them, for Svatantrika, are Rangshin Gidrupa, are inherently existent. Prasankika doesn't accept that, that there's something there. But still, uh, phenomena for Svatantrika, they have to be posited as existing by appearing to a consciousness. Then, although such is not contradicting the context of the mode of subsistence of a falsity posited through the force of appearing to an awareness, that part we already talked about, if a certain base, that is a certain phenomena, Ron has to go. If a certain base, certain phenomena, had a mode of subsistence, an objective mode of existence, Jimpa says, not posited through the force of an appearing to an awareness. That means whether you had an awareness of it or not, it existed there in an objective way. Such a combination of appearance and emptiness would not at all be suitable because discordant modes of abiding in appearance cannot occur in what is truly established, such as was explained earlier. If something is, again, truly established means truly existent. If something is truly existent, um, there cannot be a disparity in how it appears and how it exists. Okay, we're getting over our skis here. Let's let's go back to Jimpa's translation. It's not a problem for false mode of existence posited through our cognition, but such a convergence becomes untenable.
how did she how did she say the mode of subsistence of the falsity of positive becomes untenable that means it's 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 not you can't logically sustain it if we are speaking about speaking of an objective mode of existence not posited by the virtue of its perception in cognition for if something were to possess true existence and tr tr true establishment as defined earlier there could be no disparity between the way the thing actually is and the way it appears. If something is true, whether you're talking about true existence or not, if something is true, that means the mode of abiding accords with the way that it appears. Like say, for instance, if you're your neighbor keeps on moving the fence. I love this example that Dalai Lama used in the, the uh, one of his compositions on the middle way, the present Dalai Lama. If your neighbor keeps on moving his fence further away from his house, so it's infringing on your, your property, right? But every time you see him and you're asking about it, he's smiling and saying, oh, there's no problem. It's, there's a disparity between how he actually is crafty trying to get your land and the way that he appears. He appears as smiling and wants to sell you a new car or something like that, right? For if something were to possess true existence as defined earlier, there could be no disparity between the way the thing actually is and the way it appears. Making sense? Nadine? Yeah? KT? Okay, that's <laughs> it's not too bad, actually, if you think about it. So if something were to be true, here here we're talking about truly existent. If something is truly existent, that means it's it in one sense it's true, right? That means the way that it if it's true, that means the way that it appears has to be the way that it exists. But phenomena like a table appear to have uh, to, that the, the the table and its parts are different entities, where, uh, whereas they are not. So the, the table can't be truly existent. What do you think, Jennifer? Does that make sense? For that, that's kind of the, in the Svatantrika point of view, how they're the logic that they're using to establish that that phenomena here material uh, let's say compounded phenomena are empty of true existence because they appear all of them have parts they always the the whole and the parts always appear to be different whereas they cannot be they have to be the same entity therefore they're not true or they're not truly existent. Okay, Anna, makes sense? Yeah, yeah, that's what I think too, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, so then, uh, Jimba's text continues, for if something is truly existent, it must remain so invariably shunning any aspect of falsehood. Or as Anne says, for if something is truly established, it must abide in a manner devoid of falsity in all respects. Jimba says it must remain invariably true, shunning any aspect of falsehood. Furthermore, the cognition that perceives the parts and their bearer, the parts and the whole, as distinct entities, would have to be veridical. Oh my, help me out. Who knows what veridical means? Diana, you, you have a good vocabulary. Related to truth. Ah, okay. It's a 25 cent word. Right. Diana Wedding, Weddington, I wasn't, I, I was actually thinking of Diana Abramo, but you probably have a good, a good vocabulary too. Do you know that word veridical? like veracity and so forth. Uh, how does Anne translate it here? 
the awareness to which the parts of it is different as it would have to be mis unmistaken and thereby damaging one entity. Furthermore, the cognition that, per that perceives the parts and the bearer as distinct entities would have to be veridical, which would invalidate there being one entity. That means if the cognition that perceives the parts and the whole as being distinct, if that were to be true, if they were to be distinct, that would contradict there being one entity, to say it in other words, right? More simply. <laughs> Maybe not more simply, but uh, so uh, and Klein says, for if something is truly established, it must abide in a matter devoid of falsity in all respects. And since appearance and being, how it appears and how it actually is, would necessarily be concordant if it was truly existent, the awareness to which parts in the whole appear as different entities would have to be unmistaken, thereby damaging their being one entity, or as Jimpa says, which would invalidate their being one entity. Okay, how are we doing? Making sense? Suvansh? Satisfied? Yeah, coming? Richard? Yeah, Sheila? Anything? Okay. Paul, what are you thinking? You're, 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 in thinking mode there. I, I was just trying to see how, what uh, uh, Jimpo was translating as veridical. Just, I think it's just uh, uh, Dunbar Trupa, I think is all he was saying. I think it's yeah. just Dunbar Trupa in, in Tibetan. So truly existent or, or something like that, yeah. Yeah, truly it's established, something truly like established, that. established, yeah. So Anne has said, for if something is truly established, it must be abide in a matter devoid of falsity. Okay, so let's continue. Once this absence of true existence of conditioned things, because so far we talked about things that have obvious parts, like material or mind, which has temporal moments, right? In the, uh, once this absence of true existence of conditioned things is established, so in a sense, it's proved, according to Svatantrika, they proved that uh, conditioned things are empty of true existence. Okay, the absence of true existence of conditioned things is established. One can then also negate with the very same reasoning the true existence of unconditioned or uncompounded phenomena. Space, emptiness, the two cessations. There's a numberless kinds of uncompounded uh, of uncompounded phenomena, of permanent phenomena. For example, Jimpa translates, one must admit that even unconditioned space pervades some material objects. I'm not sure what he means, some material objects. It, it, space pervades all material objects. Uh, well, maybe. And says it must be asserted that space pervades certain physical objects. I'm not sure what the point of that is. Uh, and thus there must be parts that pervade the east of the object, parts that pervade the west, the north, the south, uh, up and down and so forth, and parts that extend in other directions. So that would mean that space has parts. Also, shunyata doesn't exist from its own side, right? It, it also is empty of the true existence. Emptiness only exists with relationship to that which you are, you know, to its basis. That is the emptiness of your of my mug the emptiness of the tree, the emptiness of the, the walls and so forth. It's nice to see in the Prajnaparamita, the large Prajnaparamita Sutra, when it's talking about different examples like this, often it's given, the Buddha says, trees and walls, <laughs> which still exist now, you know, so it's not like using some arcane thing that only existed then. 
Likewise, suchness, re continuing in Chimpa's text, that means emptiness, also has numerous directional parts in terms of its extension, as well as conceptually distinct parts, those realized by proceeding in subsequent moments of cognition. And, and translates that, likewise, reality, that is to say, emptiness, also has many parts pervading phenomena. So you can say the, the uh, say if I'm talking about the emptiness of my meditation room here, my loft, there's the, there's the emptiness of the, what's that? That's the world. That's the West, <laughs> on that side, that's the West, the emptiness of the Eastern side. The so the, the emptiness of this loft has parts. Likewise, uh, so she said, likewise, reality or emptiness also has many parts pervading phenomena, as well as many different parts realized by different earlier and later awarenesses or did Jimpa say moments of awareness? Likewise, such as and subsequent moments of cognition. So you can say the emptiness that was perceived by the the mind at the ten o'clock, the emptiness that was perceived at eleven o'clock, the emptiness that was perceived at at uh, twelve or one or whatever. The same is also true of other unconditioned phenomena. Now, since parts and their whole, their bearer, cannot be different entities, does that go well with your mind now? The, the, the whole and the parts are one entity, one nature? Okay. Now, since parts and their bearer cannot be different entities, they are of one entity. Furthermore, a disparity between the appearance and reality is permissible in something that is false. This is the same argument that was used earlier talking about compounded things. A disparity between appearance and reality is permissible in something that is false, but not in something that is truly existent. If something is truly existent, it has to be true. So there can't be a disparity between how it appears and how it actually is. So when one engages in the foregoing refutations, one will establish that all phenomena lack true existence. First, establishing that compounded phenomena lack true existence, and then extending that same logic to <laughs> uncompounded phenomena <laughs> like space uh, and uh, emptiness and so forth. How are we doing? Okay. This is the approach of Shantarakshita and his spiritual heir, Kamala Shila. Those who confine their, confine their analysis of parts and wholes to condition things alone suffer from a, a weak intellect. Or as Anne says, since this treatment is the assertion of the father Shantarakshita and his spiritual son Kamala Shila, reckoning part and whole only for functioning things is a flaw for those who, with small intelligence. So he's saying you've got to you've got to extend their argumentation not just to material, uh, not just to compounded phenomena, but also to uh, uncompounded phenomena. Okay. Make sense? Okay. No one has any questions? Okay, so the text continues. Now, there is indeed a sense of falsehood that is well known even to a mind not informed by philosophical thinking. You know, you know that the face in the mirror is not a real face, for example. 
there is indeed a sense of falsehood that is well known even to a mind not informed by philosophical thinking. But this is not the same sense of falsehood being proposed here by the Majamaka, by the Majamaka. Therefore, although things can be posited by such a non-philosophical mind, this is only in the sense acknowledged within, a, within such a perspective. This would not be accepted by the Majamaka to exhaust the meaning of being posited by the mind. It's difficult to understand his sentence, I think. And translated this. Although a falsity such as a malicious, magician's illusion, which is renowned as false among those whose minds have not been affected by tenets. So that's a little bit of, she's, she put in brackets, there's some commentary uh, where Jimpa says non-philosophical mind. Things can be posited by such a non-philosophical mind. She says, although a falsity, such as a magician's illusion, is posited by an awareness, the status of being posited by an awareness is in accordance with how that is renowned to those whose minds have not been affected by tenets. In the Svatantrika's own system, it is not merely that status which is asserted as the meaning of being posited by an awareness. Jimpa says, therefore, although things can be posited by such a non-philosophical mind, so that's using the example of looking at a face in a mirror or, or looking at... Uh, a horse and so forth. You can posit the horse, you know, say that the, the horse exists uh, to that non-philosophical mind. This is only in the sense acknowledged within such a perspective. Or as, as Anne says, is posited by an awareness is in accordance with how that is renowned to those people whose minds have not been affected by tenants. So they're saying that to people who are not using philosophical terminology, something could be posited as existing like the horns of a rabbit or uh, the face in the mirror and so forth. Uh, in the Svatantrika's own system, it is not merely that status which is asserted as the meaning of being posited by an awareness. Okay, a little bit tough, I think. Okay, let's let's continue. Jimpa says right after that, therefore, although things can be posited by such a non-philosophical mind, as we just read, this is only in the sense of acknowledge, the sense acknowledged within such, such a perspective, non-philosophical non perspective. This would not be accepted by the Majamaka, in this case, Vatantrika, to exhaust the meaning of being posited by the mind. In view of this, although there is no mode of existence that is not posited by virtue of being perceived by the mind, again, this is talking about Svatantraka, right? There's no mode of existence that is not posited by virtue of being perceived by a mind. <clears throat> it is not a contradiction in this tradition of Svatantrika for there to be a mode of existence that is posited by virtue of being perceived by the mind, yet is not a mere nominal designation. So 
So Anne translates that. Thus, even though there is no motive of subsistence, not posited by the force of appearing to an awareness. In this system, it is not contradictory for there to be a mode of subsistence posited by the force of that, but which is not merely nominally imputed. That means it is not a mere imputation, as Prasangika says. Hence, the objects of negation of the two middle way schools come to differ greatly for the mind. Or Jimpa says, given this, a great deal of difference can be perceived by the mind between the objects of negation of the two Majamika schools. Majamaka schools. So Svatantrika says things are <clears throat> posited by virtue of being perceived by the mind. There's something out there, Rang Shingi Drupa, inherent existence, but they're posited by the force of their appearing to a mind. It is not a contradiction in the Svatantrika system for there to be a mode of existence that is posited by virtue of being perceived by the mind. They, they say there's no contradiction yet is not a mere nominal designation. They say, so they're saying there's no contradiction because there is something out there that is a necessary part, the 50-50 trade-off. KT, what do you think? I'm just trying to link this whole last page to the, what the title of the section was, which was, explaining the magician's illusion analogy and the reference. And um, he hasn't really talked about that at all in this long explanation, but I see these themes of parts and whole and appearance and reality, and now talking about labels and designations. And I'm not sure how this links back to that actual magician's illusion, which I thought the section. Right. Well, that was, that was, giving, that was the example that was being used here, how right. uh, there can be, a combination of something that appears one way but is empty of being that way and therefore it is not true like the appearance of the horse appears to be a real horse but is devoid of being a real horse is not a real horse that was part of the magician's mm -hmm. illusion example right so here that's being extended into talking about material things. Material things have parts, first of all, and also mental phenomena, let's say compounded phenomena, have parts, yet they appear to be, the parts appear to be different entities than the, than the whole the legs to the mind, to the mental consciousness, to the thought conception, seems to be a different entity than the table itself. That's kind of like the horse uh, appearing, what does it say? Go back. So the, the appearance of the, of the table and the parts appear to be, when I say appear, it doesn't mean only to mental to visual consciousness, but to mental consciousness, they appear to be different entities, which is a falsity. So the example in the magician's illusion is that the horse appears to be real. There seems to be a real horse there, whereas it there is no real horse there. So in the terms of the, the whole and the parts, although they appear to be different entities, they are not different entities. So they are empty of being, the, the horse illusion is empty of being true. Compounded phenomena are empty of being true because they appear one way, but are devoid of existing that way. Does that help? Um, it, it helps, but when I think about the, 
the horse. I can see, yes, it doesn't, it didn't appear. It, it appears to be a horse. It's not a horse. It was a stick and a stone that had some magic done on it. But then when we say parts, I'm thinking about, well, let's talk. I see what you're saying on the table, but then when we say- So it, the example it, here, so we don't like, apply parts to the horse. You're not talking about the tail okay. and the head. Okay, and yeah, the, right. But yeah, I wonder why yeah. they use that, why he talks about parts and whole here in that in conjunction with this analogy, it gets a little fuzzy for me. I see the okay. false appearance and the appearance. So that's the main thing to to, to uh, observe, observe here or to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Talking about is that <clears throat> something can't be true if its way of appearing and its way of existing are different. So we can say that the the illusion of a horse is false because it appears to be real, but it is not. So it is false. When you talk about, then he extends that kind of logic not to to, uh, to material things. Let's say to compounded phenomena, both material and and consciousness. They all uh, they all. Um, they all have parts. There's nothing which is partless. Mm -hmm. And those parts always appear to the consciousness as being different entities than the whole. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the crucial point. It's not talking, it's not trying to bring parts to the horse or the horse to the parts. It's just talking about this general example of how things appear to be one way, but are if they don't exist that way, then they are false. They're not truly established. They're not truly existent. So now it's using that in regard to compounded phenomena. Compounded phenomena, Shantarakshita says, uh, and Kamalashila and so forth, the, the Svatantrikas say, are not truly existent because they appear to, they they appear that the parts in the whole are different entities, but they are not different entities. So this kind of logic, we have to get familiar with this because in, in Prasangika, when we use various logical reasonings, there are a lot of different things that seem slightly different. Uh, here, the main thing is that the compounded phenomena, and, and later extended to uncompounded phenomena, it appears as though their parts and the whole are different entities. That's what one would might think. Maybe that's what Richard was thinking earlier when he was, when he was talking about the table and its parts. They appear to be different entities, but they are the same entity. So some of these questions come up in um, Jim, Jim Blumenthal's translation of Shantarakshita's text, if you happen to have that. Let's say, for instance, um, if things were, oh, no, I won't go into that. Okay, If things were unitary, if they were just one thing, then when you looked at them, you would see all the, you would see the whole thing. If you had a table or you had a, a piece of wood painted red on one side and blue on the other, if you looked at the red side, you would also, if it was one entity, it would have to be, uh, you would have to see blue also. Okay, let, let's let's continue on. We're almost finished here. Coraggio, as my Italian friends would say in Istituto Lama Son Capa, come on. Be courageous. So Lama Sokaba says, I have offered these explanations here, seeing that the eyes of people today will come to be excellently open to the view, the correct view of emptiness, if they are first well led through the identification of what constitutes true existence and what constitutes grasping a true existence according to this system of Svatantrika, including a brief introduction to their reasoning, negating them, and are then presented with the Prasagika Majamaka system. 
So he's saying, if you, you know, the, the purpose of presenting this, because it's not mentioned in Chandrakirti's text at all, this Fatantrika elaboration is Lama Tsongkhapa is using it as a teaching tool that if you can understand the Svatantrika presentation, then, um, where is it? Where's the whole sentence? I have offered these explanations, seeing that the eyes of people today will become excellently open to the view, the Prasakika view, if they're first well led through the identification of identifying the true existence in Svatantrika and what constitutes grasp, grasping a true existence according to their system. Okay. That's done. Okay. So that, uh, yeah, difficult. But now, of course, Prasangika is also difficult and subtle, but this, now we're getting on ground that maybe is a little bit more um uh, understandable at the beginning. So the next section is identifying, in Jimpa's translation, identif identifying grasping a true existence according to the Prasagika Majamaka standpoint, or as Anne says, identification of the conception of true existence. Zimpa, grasping a true existence um, according to the Prasagika. These Outlines are not in the Tibetan text. They came back many, many pages earlier when the outline said, uh, there were two sections. The, that is uh, identifying uh, true existence and grasping the true existence of the Svatantrika and identifying uh, true existence and grasping a true existence of the Prasangika. So here it just says, in the Tibetan text, it says, just says Nipa, Nipa Ni. So that means the second. So that means identifying, grasping a true existence according to the Prasangika, my Jamaka standpoint. Okay. If one understands how, <clears throat> according to this system, phenomena are posited through mere conceptualization, so I think that means here, now we're saying this system now is talking about Prasangika. One can then easily recognize how its opposite would constitute grasping at true existence. As Anne says, with respect to this, if you understand how in this Prasang in this system, that means Prasangika system, phenomena are assigned as merely posited, or you could say merely imputed, through the force of conceptuality, you will easily understand the conception of true existence that conceives the opposite of this. Therefore, the presentation of the identification of the con conception of true existence in Prasangika has two parts. Reading from Anne, how phenomena are posited through the force of conceptuality and the conception of true existence that conceives the opposite of that. So one is true, how things are posited or imputed by the force of, of conception, and how phenomena are grasped as truly existent, which is the opposite of that. Okay. So Chimpa's text has a headline, how phenomena are posited through conception, conceptualization, or Anne says, through the force of conceptualization. Okay, so now, first of all, there's a quotation from the questions of Upali Sutra. Who knows, who's heard of the questions of Upali Sutra? Jennifer, have you heard? No? Oh, no. You heard, but you don't remember. Nadine, have you heard? I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's the, what, the 24th, I think the 24th chapter of the Ratna, of the uh, Ratnakuta. What, 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 are, what are you reading? You're you're reading daily. You're not reading the Ratnakuta. What are you reading? The Avatamsaka and the Ratnakuta. 
I have both. Okay. So it's oh. the 24th, 24th chapter of the Ratnakuta. Uh, Upali was, uh, we mentioned, we told some beautiful stories about Upali before. Upali was the 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 monk who came after after Buddha, after Shakyamuni became enlightened, uh, and some of the noblemen left a uh, couple of Vastu where where Buddha was born to become his disciples, you know, kind of a little bit kind of proud and so forth. And they brought Upali the barber along, who was low caste, not like the, the nobles, uh to to they they were expecting to cut their hair locks off like the Buddha did at this one stupa nearby. And then they would they would send back their clothing and jewels to Kapalavastu. But Upali wanted to go along. And so he used a good logic. He said, if I do that, if I carry back your clothes and crowns and jewels and everything, before I even get there, they'll assume I killed you and they will kill me. So I have to go along. So they they agreed he would be their kind of servant on the trip to find Shakyamuni. When they finally found the Buddha, he had already been enlightened, and they wanted to take ordination. Uh, they, they assumed that they would be, the noblemen would be ordained first, but the Buddha ordained Upali before them. So he was their... <laughs> He was their senior in, in, you know, elder in seniority. So he would always, uh, you know, he would always be given first preference like that. Upali was the, the foremost in what? Do you remember? Sean, do you remember what Upali was? Do you remember the Buddha, Shariputra was foremost in wisdom Maha Mogaliana was foremost in magic powers. What was Upali foremost in? Anyone? Stephen? The, the Vinaya, George? In the Vinaya, yes. That's what Paul says. In, in morality. So uh, this 24th chapter of the Ratnakuta is uh, questions. And in this chapter is this section called the... Uh, the Sutra of the Three Heaps. Uh, Triskanda, Triskanda Uja, Triskanda Sutra. That's what we call the confession of the 35 Buddhas. So this, this chapter is, we've, we encounter it again and again, but in this chapter, the Buddha teaches Upali subtle things about emptiness uh, that's even used here right at the beginning of talking about Prasangika. So here from Jimpa's text, it says, questions of Upali. The flowers with their open petals that delight so many minds, the supreme golden mansions resplendent and attractive, none of these has a creator. They're not created by Brahma, or I would say, created by Indra or Brahma or something else. They're not created uh, inherently uh, by other means. They're posited through the power of conception. Through conceptualization, the world is imputed. He uses the word imputed quite clearly and says, here, the various mind-pleasing, blossoming, blossoming flowers and attractive, shining, supreme golden houses have no inherently existent maker at all. They are posited through the power of conceptuality. Through the power of conceptuality, the world is imputed. So just for reference, this is... Have to look closely here. All right. The wrong glasses. The, this, these verses are translated. If you have the eighty-four thousand uh, website, do you know the eighty-four thousand website uh, with all of the translations to so many texts? You can actually find this Upale Paripricha Sutra, and you can find this section. This is verse uh, 
107 in that in that text. So I'm going to read the verses just before it so you get the context. So the Buddha, the Bhagavan, is telling Upali at this point. He says, uh, in two verses before the one that we've quoted here, I have taught about the frightening hells that terrify many thousands of beings, and yet there is no one who upon death takes a terrifying rebirth. Ooh. There is no one who inflicts, next verse, there is no one who inflicts harm with a sword, a spear, or a blade. It is through the power of concepts that those in the lower realms, it is through the power of, the, of concepts that in those lower realms, non-existent weapons are seen to fall upon the body. What does it mean, non-existent weapons? It means non-inherently existent weapons, right? Then the verse that we have, their translation is, there is no one who has made the various delightful blossoming flowers and pleasant radiant golden palaces. They manifest through the power of concepts. And then our verse has five lines. That's actually the next, the first line of the next verse. The, the next verse, 108 says, the world is fabricated by concepts. Fools discriminate by clinging to ideas. Clinging and non-clinging do not exist. Fabrications are like illusions and mirages. In that translation of the 84,000, it mentions that this is quoted in Chandrakirti's clearly worded <laughs> prasanapada, or clear words in uh this verse 105 and the next three, so that means 105 through 108, which I've just read, are quoted by Chandrakirti in chapter one of the Prasanapada. Okay, so that's kind of the context. So here, uh, even though the Upali Paripricha, Upali Sutra, you know, that which is requested by uh, Upali, so you can see in Anne's text, she has the name there, Upali Pare Pricha, at the end of that first line. Um, here the Buddha is teaching about phenomena me being merely imputed. So Jimpa's text, Jimpa's translation continues, thus phenomena are taught to be posited or imputed through the power of conceptualization. On many on many occasions, phenomena are described as mere imputations of thought and as posited by virtue of the power of conceptualization. It's found many, many times in the Buddhist sutras and in Nargajuna's writings, for instance, in his 60 stanzas of reasoning, which we've talked about before, uh, Rikpa Trupa, I guess. Um, what is this? This is stanza 37, if you happen to have a translation of that. The Buddhists have stated that the world is conditioned by ignorance. Right? Of the 12 links, ignorance is the first link. Everything is conditioned by ignorance. So why would it be unreasonable to say that the world is a product of conceptualization. Or as Anne says, uh, Jimpa says, is a product of conceptualization. And translates, the perfect Buddha has stated the world has the condition of ignorance. Therefore, how, how could it not be feasible, double negatives for those of you who you know, don't like no, double negatives, how could it not be feasible that the world is imputed by conceptuality. She has a bracket imputed by, he has a product of conceptualization. The meaning of this statement is explained, well, Jimpa's translation says, the commentary, that means the commentary by Chandrakirti of the 60 stanzas. So remember, Chandrakirti wrote a good number of commentaries. He wrote his two commentaries to fundamental wisdom. He wrote the Prasanna Pada in the Majamaka Vatara. He wrote a commentary to Arya Davis' 400 stanzas. 
he wrote a commentary to the 60 stanzas of reasoning, this text. So in Chandra Kirti's own commentary to that, I say in, in, in Anne's translation, it says, the meaning of this statement is explained in Chandra Kirti's commentary as being, so this is like not quoting it exactly, just it's sort of giving the gist of it, that the worlds, that is beings and the environments, so say the vessel world and the inhabitants therein, are in, are imputed by conceptuality. They are not established by way of their own entities. So that's what that stanza in Nargajuna 60 stanzas of reasoning means, according to Chandrakirti. Sort of quite clear. Phenomena are not established by way of their own entities. They are imputed by conceptuality. And then a quotation from the 400 stanzas, and, and recognizes this as chapter 8, verse 3. So Jimpa says, if without conceptualization, attachment and so on do not exist at all. Oh, so Aryadeva was a disciple of Nargajuna, right? So he's writing about emptiness. You know, his whole thing is uh, later to be recognized as Prasankika. At that time, even the the Svatantrika still accept Aryadeva, but but if you look at what he's written, it really appears to be Prasankika point of view. He says, if without conceptualization, attachment and so on do not exist at all, they're only imputed by concepts. What intelligent person would grasp something as perfectly real and as conception? Does that make sense? Not quite clear, right? Last line. You think, Richard, you got that? You think, okay. What, what, do, you, what do you understand it to mean? What I understand it to mean is that there's no um, true existence that exists without, there is no true existence period. There are only conceptions, only conceptualizations. Everything is imputed on something that does on a phenomena that don't truly exist, but that are conditioned in some way. Yeah. So. This makes a lot more sense to me than, than the Svatantrika. Right, right, right. Yeah, I know. Me too. Uh, so when it says, Jimba says, what intelligent person would grasp something as perfectly real or as Anne says, uh, who with intelligence would hold these are real objects? That would that tends to mean truly existent. How could you say that these are truly existent and also conceptual? Because that means that they are how could they be truly existent if they are merely imputed by conception? So here he gives, in his commentary, that means Chandrakirti's commentary on Aryadeva. Remember we said Chandrakirti had commentary to the 60 stanzas. He also had commentary to Aryadeva's 400. So in Chandrakirti's commentary to the 400 stanzas, he says, those things that exist only because of the presence of conceptualization and have no existence when there is no conception are without doubt like a, like the snake conceived upon a coiled rope. Definitely, they are definitely not established in their own right. So before we go, Paul, you just you just sent me a message about news from Betsy. Can you can you say what that was? Uh, certainly. Uh, yeah, Betsy just said that um, she had had to go away for a few days, uh, but in her return, he has apparently been getting nourishment and his uh, conditions improved, so it just sounds like there was some sort of issue with, uh, but I guess, like his nourishment or whatever, so, but Jeffrey seems to be on the mend. Okay, that's good to hear. So, uh, 
Jeffrey and Elizabeth Napper or Betsy were married at one time. I think when we went to Tibet, Paul, they were we were all on the same bus together going to where was it to uh, Shigatse, I think. You and Betsy and and Jeffrey and I and Lama, what's his name? The the Columbia University. Ken Jams Ken Jamsfell. Ken Jamsfell. Ken Jamsfell offered to pay my my room in Shigatse because I was a monk who is no longer a monk. Okay, so in his commentary, Chimpa uh, had that. Um, here, Anne's translation says she's she's translating Chandrakirti's commentary here that we just read, Jimpa's. Those that exist only when conceptuality exists, that which is ex exists only when conceptuality exists. In other words, the phenomena are, are merely imputed by conceptuality. When you have no conceptuality, they are not posited to exist. And they do not exist when conceptuality does not exist, are undoubtedly ascertained as not established by way of their own entity like a snake imputed upon a coiled rope. Or Jimpa says a snake conceived upon a coiled rope. I think the word uh, in the Tibetan is actually the word for imputation, which has you know, one different um, consonant on it than the word for just conception. So Jimpa is taking it as conception. I think, that, I think uh, Betsy's is probably the correct one like a snake imputed on a coil rope. So now we get to the, the Prasangika example. When we mentioned earlier, the Svatantrika favorite example to talk about how phenomena are uh, established, how they, you know, to identify true establishment, to identify how people grasp at it is the example of the magician's illusion. Whereas I mentioned at the time, the Prasangika special example is that of mistaking a coiled rope uh, for a snake. So Tukhtin Chimpa says in, in his translation here, perfectly established means something existing in its own right and conceptuality, conceptualization arises in regard to it. Let's go back. So, um, where does that word in, in Anne's text, right after the quotation from Chandrakirti, she says, real objects. So, what is that quoting? That's quoting Arya Deva's root text, right? Just so there's Arya Deva's root text that has four lines, and then there's Chandrakirti's commentary about that. When, when, um, uh, Jimpa, Jimpa translates it as perfectly real uh, and translates it as real objects in the sentence, since desire and so forth do not exist without conceptuality, who with intelligence would hold that these are real objects, or as Jimpa says, perfectly real, and are also conception. How could you say that they are truly existent and also conceptual? So, Anne's translation, Anne's commentary says, real objects are those established by way of their own entity. That means truly, truly existent objects. Conceptual means <clears throat> produced independence upon that conceptuality. Okay. We're in the Prasangika section. Hip, hip. <laughs> Paul, what do you think? Uh, I, I just wanted to uh, share an anecdote about ropes and snakes with you, uh, which is uh, one time when uh, Bill McGee and I were, we were uh, kind of running a summer Tibetan program and we had a house we could stay in. Um, I, I, went, I went into the house. He had gone away for the week and I walked into the house one time and I looked in the kitchen. And I thought, oh, real funny, McGee. I'm going to fall for the three foot rubber snake in the middle of the kitchen gag. And I thought, 
actually, you know, that doesn't really sound like McGee who would sort of leave a big rubber snake in the middle of the kitchen floor. <laughs> and so I kind of like got down and I blew air towards it and it puffed up and started moving. <laughs> it was a snake. It was a snake. So it was me imputing a rubber snake on an actual snake. <laughs> It was actually empty, <laughs> actually empty of rubber snake. Exactly. <laughs> oh my. Okay. So how are we doing? Any any questions? Richard, Karen, Stephen, Nadine, you must have something. Or you you can wait for Dharma hour. You can ask for them. David, Anna, anyone? Jennifer, you satisfied? Beginning to feel a little less burdensome? When you go back, after we get a, a bit into Prasangika, you go back and read the Svatantrika section, you'll say, oh, yeah, at that point, when we read it the first time, it didn't make any sense at all. When you go back and look at it again, it may... Also, you may not even believe the presentation at the time. I remember when I was teaching Lama Osel uh, at at Sarah in India, uh, outside of Mysore. Uh, I would teach him something, or I would tell him something about the Mayans or the Aztecs or something like that, and he would look at me like, "Yeah, right, that's what you say." You know, he, he didn't use those words, but he's kind of skeptical. Then when we had these books that Peter Kedge sent, you know, these nice British uh, kids' books uh, with pictures and big letters and everything, and we'd read about the Aztecs or the Mayans or whatever, and he would go, oh, it was true. <laughs> what he said was true. So one other thing I wanted to say was um, Spatantraka Majamaka, I remember... Yangtze Rinpoche studying Spatantrika with Geshe Zogpa, studying it at Sarah. It, it's considered by the Tibetans to be, you know, really, really useful stepping stone, as Lama Tsongkhapa said, to understanding the Prasangika. So if you want to understand more clearly about the Prasangika, uh, the next time Yangtze Rinpoche comes to Shanti Deva Center, Maybe you should ask him your Svatantrika questions from this section in Gopa Rapsel. He may be able to answer. But, uh, you know, it, 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 it is so important. Also, collecting merit by reading the sutras. Uh, I know Nadine has been reading several sutras. I, I've told you before, I remember Geshe Nalandarge in, um, in uh, Dharamsala, the Library of Tibetan Works and Archives, He'd give class in the morning. Maybe the last class would finish at noon or one or something like that. And the rest of the day, um, you know, he would do other practices at home, of course. But he would always come back to the library. He would circumambulate the library many, many times. It's great geshe, circumambulating the library. And he would go into the reading room where they had all of the Tibetan texts. And he would read the sutras, you know. Every day he would sort of go through the whole, uh, the whole uh, kangyur. Uh, maybe he also read the tengyur, the the commentaries, the shastras. Also, I can't remember. But that just shows uh, these kinds of activities are something that the great beings do. Also, you know, circumambulating, reading the sutras to accumulate merit and everything. And in the case of Yangtze Rinpoche and others studying the Svatantrika in such detail, uh, all of these various texts. I think that's what Jim Blumenthal's thesis, that his translation of the Majamaka Alamkara uh, benefited so much because he had access to Tibetan lamas who had studied the text. And if you read the, his notes in it and his comments within it, preface and so forth, it mentions how they helped in many cases to understand what was being said. Okay, so we're, uh, we have a Dharma office hour, an hour and a half, or about. If anyone hasn't signed up, I think there's still a spot. Um, 
but there will be no class, no discussion on Monday because I have a doctor's appointment. Uh, and uh, I will see you next. When is it, Sheila? January 15th or something like that? Yes, it's January, I think, 17th. Oh, January 17th. Uh, let me let me check the calendar. January. January 13th. January 13th. 13th. Okay. Oh, I don't even, it hasn't migrated to my iPad yet. I have it downstairs. Okay, so we have a nice break over Christmas and New Year's, a chance to recover from your, your New Year's celebrations. So um, let's let's bring up the dedication prayers. Mary Ellen, there you go. So the dedication prayers begin with Gewa D. You're on this the wrong page there. There we go. Oh, all right. There we go. Due to these virtues, gewa means virtue, because that includes both merit and collection of wisdom. Due to these virtues, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha. May I quickly become a Guru Buddha and lead all migrators without exception into that enlightened state. So thinking, due to these merits, that we've created merits today, listening with open minds, contemplating, meditating, um, and, and having motivated at the beginning, kind of the inertia throughout the, throughout the practice, we've created a, a lot of merits. May they become the cause of my quickly becoming a Buddha to lead each and every migrator migrating in the six realms of samsara without exception, even the enemies now into that enlightened state. May the supreme precious bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not, in, not diminish, but increase more and more. It's actually a prayer. And then the prayer for the swift return of Lama Subha, peerless teacher and assembly of children of the victorious ones, you Shravakas, Pratika Buddhas, victorious Losang, Drakpa, father and sons, together with your lineage, all the objects of refuge of the infinite realms, please now bestow the virtue and goodness to accomplish this prayer. Or you could say, please bestow the virtue and goodness to accomplish this prayer right now in holding and spreading the Muni's precious and complete teachings through explanation and practice. You were the armor of patience that is never discouraged, Lama Zoba. Incomparable guru, to you I make this request. Soul gateway through which all benefit and happiness emerge while you were striving both for the welfare of the victorious one's teachings and for the the welfare of living beings exclusively, not centered on your own welfare, you suddenly departed to peace. At this, I was devastated. Nevertheless, nevertheless, through the undeceiving truths of the oceanic blessings of the three jewels and the great waves of bodhicitta of the children of the victorious ones, May the smile of a new reincarnation swiftly beam in glory for us fortunate disciples. And for all of our teachers, the Yangtze Rinpoches, the Sirkon Rinpoches, the Dakbo Rinpoches, Dalai Lamas, you who are my eyes for viewing all the infinite scriptures. If I just read them with my physical eyes, I don't understand very much. But you, in explaining them to me, you are my eyes for viewing all the infinite scriptures, supreme gateway for us fortunate ones traveling to liberation, engaging as you do with skillful means, moved by mercy, all illuminating spiritual friends, please live a long and stable life. Uh, 
then seal the dedication. This in our last class before a nice break, Christmas holiday break. Seal the dedication in the emptiness of the three spheres. The merits and the collection of wisdom we created, the virtues we've created that we want to dedicate, that we've just dedicated. They appear to be truly existent. Like the magician's horse appears to be true to those whose minds are still affected by the, the spell. But they are empty of that. They do function. The fact that they're empty doesn't mean that they don't function or they don't have any causal consequence. The goals dedicated to can't be can't be found anywhere. The Buddha, the, the state of our being, a Buddha and so forth, we might have a mental image of us with a, a body with 32 major marks, 80 major signs, and so, <laughs> and so forth. But those are empty of inherent existence. They appear, there's a, there's a combination of appearance and emptiness. They are empty of existing the way that they appear. And the act of dedication, joining these virtues to those goals, can't be found anywhere on any part of the dedication. It's just a name imputed upon this collection of parts, wishing that these merits ripen in those ways. Okay, thank you so much. Look forward thank to seeing you in January. Uh, have a good holiday and uh, study if you can. I, I will try to put up some reading on from uh, Vasubundu's 20 stanzas, not his 30, <laughs> Jim Budput, and from uh, Jim Blumenthal's translation of Shantarakshita's Majamaka Alamkara about uh, these topics so you can read over vacation if you want. Take care. Thanks, Thank you. Everybody. Also, everyone, I'd like to make one last announcement. Oh, We'd like to make a holiday right. offer. Excuse me? Courses, which are world the world okay, so we'd also like to make a holiday, if you'd like to make a holiday offering for Venerable George, um, you can do that through the website. We put up the link, and I'll also send an email to follow up. But um, just to say thank you for everything, Venerable George. Thanks all. Uh, I will see you in January. Take care. Well, I'll see some some of you maybe in an hour and a half for the Dharma hour. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.